X-Men games, X-Men games, X-Men games. We have spent a great deal of time lately looking at titles that feature this affable bunch of mutant misfits. When it comes to this Marvel franchise, a mixed bag of quality would be delivered during the 90s. But amongst the many offerings available, there would be a surprising amount of decent ones that players had at their disposal. Some of these were so fantastic that they are considered by many as all-time greats such as the brilliant high-flying fighting games, X-Men Children of the Atom, and the unbelievably good tag team crossover that is X-Men vs Street Fighter. That's without even mentioning the top-tier arcade beat-em-up from Konami, a game that offered astonishingly six-player functionality. Due to games of this calibre existing, it is easy to overlook Capcom's Mega Man X-like mutant apocalypse on the Super Nintendo. Mega Man X-Men, yes I said that, is pretty epic, and I don't feel it gets quite as much praise as it deserves, simply due to it being overshadowed by more famous X-Men game. When I covered this game previously on here, many people in my comment section would mention that they believe there is an old school X-Men game out there which is even more criminally underrated than the Super Nintendo gem. So let's look at its history today. Hello ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here. This is X-Men 2 Clone Wars. Yeah. What are you doing in my video? Get back to where you came from. Hey, what about my world? What's wrong with it? Are you from some kind of childish game? That is not true. Hero Wars has vibrant graphics, cool gameplay, and a user-friendly interface. All right then, let's give it a try. Yeah, tell them more about it. We foul, we fall, we lose control. Enough stand up and play your role. You ask me, Top Hat, what's going on? I tell you, Hero Wars is on. It is an epic, crazy game with many heroes, modes and fame. Brave and strong Knight Galahad must save the world from tearing a pat. Archdemon took control on land, but team of heroes is in your hand. Upgrade them, teach them, mix them up and show the villain what is up. Continue journey in the guild, the mighty alliance should be built. Strike down bosses one by one until it is completely done. Be sure come back another day, new content rushing all the way. Cool events, bosses, modes and loot. Amazing heroes, it feels so goot. 100 million can't mistake, Hero Wars is best for break. Become a legend, claim your gift, 5 heroes, gems and gold to lift. Mobile gamer or PC, for different story we shall see. Right now go on and download using my link or QR code. Yeah. During the mid 90s, gamers were somewhat spoiled for choice with the amount of X-Men games that were being released. With on the home front, not just the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation receiving support, but also older 16-bit consoles such as the Super Nintendo and Sega Mega Drive still getting X-Men games too. Often with these video games being console exclusives. Mutant Apocalypse, which we mentioned earlier, was a late 1994 game that was available exclusively on the Super Nintendo, but Sega would publish some 16-bit X-Men games of their own. The first Sega-published Mega Drive X-Men game was simply titled X-Men, a game that generates both nostalgia and frustration to players in equal measures. This rather enjoyable game from Sega is infamous for one fatal flaw in particular a section whereby the game prompts the player with a mysterious warning to reset the computer. This neat bit of meta trickery required the player to physically get off their couch, go up to the Mega Drive and tap the reset button on the console. Not holding the button for too long mind you, or you'll lose your place in the game. This was certainly a nice bit of creativity, but many feel the idea went drastically astray. This game was generally well received and with the X-Men still riding the high of the animated series, it would not be long until a direct sequel was in the works. Work would be completed in 1995, with the game X-Men 2 Clone Wars being the final result. Developed by Head Games, known for their less than stellar work on other Sega titles such as Taz in Escape from Mars, Wacky World's Creative Studio and Pink Goes to Hollywood, no one was really expecting anything particularly special from this game. From the moment the game is turned on, gamers are taken straight into the action. None of that title screen mode selection malarkey, it's gameplay from the off. While this could instantly raise some questions whether the lack of a proper introduction is due to this game never being completely finished, suspicions are soon raised when you realise that the title instead has an innovative layout. 
What I mean by this is that a title screen and credit roll is reached after gamers have played the first little bit of action. An action filled start to an action filled game. Nice. For this opening section you play as a purportedly random character. Well I say purportedly as it turns out that the direction the player is holding on the d-pad will actually decide who you take charge of. Once the game proper starts, returning characters Gambit, Nightcrawler, Wolverine and Cyclops are all back and available to choose from, as well as the scientific brute known as the Beast who can climb walls and perform devastating physical attacks. In addition to this, the psychic ninja Psylocke joins the Mega Drive Ray and can utilise her psychic knife and acrobatic skills to decimate foes. Apart from these two great new options, after finishing the third level, a third mutant playable character is unlocked, but only if you beat him in combat first. I am of course referring to the master of Magni himself, Magneto. Joining the skirmish, Magneto is different from other fighters in the game as he lacks any melee attacks, instead using his energy blasts and electromagnetism to both fight offensively and hover above the ground. The player takes up control of these various X-Men heroes in the fight against the Phalanx, the techno-organic alien race that have taken over a sentinel manufacturing facility with a virus, which has also spread to the Exodus and Magneto's home of Avalon, justifying Magneto's temporary alliance with the people he generally has found to be rivals in their approach on how to integrate mutants with humanity. Switching between these seven characters at the beginning of each stage opens up a lot of range for players giving gamers a variety of different options regarding the best way in which each stage should be potentially tackled. Each fighter of course has their unique mutant abilities which can be utilised but as a bonus each one has further varied attributes relating to the likes of their speed, power and jumping ability. A case can be made that due to these choices existing, a level of replay value is instantly added as there are so many different combinations of X-Men to choose from. Building on all of this, another huge improvement to what came before this is each character's actual mutant attack power. In the previous Sega X-Men game, players were limited with energy bars, meaning there was only a finite amount of cool attacks that can be performed in a session. In X-Men 2 on the other hand, mutant attacks can be pulled off until your heart is content. After all, what's the point of playing as one of the bloody X-Men if you can't perform loads of devastating mutant attacks? Speaking of devastating, if you are feeling really destructive, some mutants have charge attacks which is also a nice touch. The variety in each X-Men paired with this one's intuitive design means only certain health pickups or level shortcuts can be reached using particular mutants, giving even more reason for gamers to experiment. As for the game's story, this one as said earlier revolves around the Phalanx story arc from the comics at the time. Professor X has sent his best to destroy the Phalanx virus which through the game soon leads to a partnership with Magneto in the joint quest to protect Earth. Much like how Spider-Man and Venom in Maximum Carnage came out near the release of the comic storyline, the Phalanx were also introduced in Uncanny X-Men 305, only released in April 1994, and created by noted comic creators Scott Lobdale, Joe Madureira, Chris Claremont and Bill Sikinwicks. Soon after their reveal, the Phalanx Covenant crossover spread between X-Men, Uncanny X-Men, X-Factor, X-Force, Excalibur, Wolverine and Cable. That's a lot of X's. Many years before BMX Triple X. The story was told over three different storylines. Generation Next, Life Signs and Final Sanction. And beyond being the driving force of X-Men 2 Clone Wars. This was adapted in the fifth season premiere of the X-Men animated series. Playing from stage to stage, the scenery is beautiful, colourful and detailed with other graphical effects adding to each area's charm. Take the snowy intro area for example, whereby the stage's harsh weather gives the level an extra layer of beauty and helps the region feel more like Siberia. When the alarm goes off on the second floor of the Sentinel complex, the red and black flashing graphical effects, sound effects and explosions all in turn add to the urgency of the section. It is details like this to add to this affair's overall quality. Of traversing from stage to stage, combining their forces, the United Mutants chase the Phalanx to the Apocalypse base. Apocalypse actively allows the virus to spread, which sees players make a return to the Savage Land to fight a clone of Brainchild, followed by a visit to the Phalanx ship to fight Deathbird, a romp in a clone factory, a trip to the Nexus, with it all finally culminating with a fight against Phalanx duplicates of themselves. 
Adventurous players can find a hidden fight with a phalanx stylized magneto, which doesn't impact the story of the game, but it is a rare hidden boss in a Sega published title, another cool feature that can be found. The game is rather short, clocking in around 4 hours if you're a completionist, and can be made even shorter if you use various cheats included in the game. As with tradition at the time, invincibility, level skip and 99 lives will make this adventure a breeze, and fortunately there's no reset the computer gimmick to challenge you right before the end. One drawback I am yet to mention is the game's 2 player mode. Rather surprisingly for a 1995 title, this is a game whereby two players can enjoy this side scroller cooperatively. However sadly, the side scroller itself suffers tremendously, displaying why most programmers didn't tend to place features like this in many games back then. Most people preferred music in this one when compared to its predecessor too. Kurt Harland of the band Information Society did the score for the title as one of his first video game scores. Much of his later work was related to Crystal Dynamics, such as the Soul Reavers titles and then the Death Junior games for Backbone Entertainment. He would speak about the title on his website, noting that the game had a different name at the time he was contacted, with him stating, in July of 1994, Mark Miller, who was later to become head of the music department at Sega, asked me to do the music for a new X-Men Genesis cartridge game called X-Men 2 The Bio Wars. It was being made by Head Games in San Francisco. The project seemed fascinating. I was given a 2 inch thick tome on the specs of the game, and I immediately took that and a big X-Men comics compilation, which I just purchased and read through them both. I had never before been very aware of the X-Men world and quickly fell into a trap of wanting to read every X-Men comic ever published, just to get the story straight. I especially liked the multiple character aspects of the game and set up with Mark's help a set of songs which would sound different depending on which character the player happened to be at any given moment. This is evident in the tracks Climbing the Temple and Factory Floor. I included the lead lines from three different characters in each. Working with the music system of the Genesis was somewhat limiting, to say the least. When Mark approached me in October of 1995 to do the full-blown versions of the X-Men music, I welcomed the opportunity to flesh out the music from the cartridge. I picked eight of my favourites and here they are. Mark and I composed Avalon 3 together and the rest are mine. Fans of Information Society will recognise the classic InSoc sound in some of these. When the game came out, the name was X-Men 2 The Clone Wars. It was one of the more successful Genesis games of 1995. It's not exactly like an Information Society album, but listening to it is obviously that it was done by Information Society. Since this record was so severely compressed in the mastering session, my MP3 encoder didn't seem to be able to deal with it. These clips are distorted. The CD doesn't sound like that. At the time of the release, the game received favourable but not amazing reviews. GamePro remarked that the sound effects and music are a mixed bag and criticised the two-player modes type scrolling but praised the large sprites and the special abilities of the player characters. Electronic Gaming Monthly, which also covered this game, were high on the character's special abilities but were criticised the game for not being much different from its predecessor, which personally I think is a tad unfair, bearing in mind all of the upgrades over the original that we have already covered throughout this video. Sure, on the surface the two games look very similar, but if you play them side by side, you will see how improved this one is over the other. They would also claim that the game never seems to come alive, despite a few cool, not to mention huge bosses and challenging levels. Next Generation remarked that the game has more playable characters, more complex moves, more levels and more gameplay twists than the original X-Men, but it is still no more than a rental title. As the years have gone by, X-Men 2 Clone Wars tends to be a game that has received more and more respect. Years after its release, Complex would put it as the 18th best game on the Sega Genesis, while Screw Attack would place it at number 20. While the title largely improved what was provided in the original game, it didn't completely reinvent the concept, and the limited game time means that most competent players could beat it in a weekend rental. You could say that the game's short length was one of the factors that didn't impress gamers in 1995, particularly when we were already in an era by this point in which grander polygonal based games on CDs were being most celebrated. 
In fact, you can blame the entire shift towards 3D and the next generation of gaming, yet another factor that hindered this one's interest. And that is without even mentioning the likes of Children of the Atom, which was graphically the most impressive looking X-Men game around as of yet. Despite seemingly gaining more recognition as an undersung classic by the day, sadly, thanks to licensing, the game's never been re-released. It would be cool to see someone like, say, Digital Eclipse work some magic on the 16-bit Marvel titles. Maybe instead of the Cowabunga collection, we could get the marvellous multi-pack. As far as I'm aware, the X-Men are now owned by Disney, and Digital Eclipse have already released Jungle Book, Aladdin and The Lion King as a Disney collection on modern hardware. So why not the X-Men or something else Marvel? As for back in 1995, after the release of this title, Sega wouldn't immediately lose their non-exclusive license for home console games based on Marvel properties. The same year would see the release of X-Men Games Masters Legacy for the Game Gear, followed by the underwhelming Spider-Man Web of Fire for the 32X, and a third X-Men title, Mojo World for the Game Gear, and Master System of all things in the following year. Yes, we can thank our buddies in Brazil for keeping that mutant torch alive in 1996. Sega would continue to aim for new titles, prototyping an X-Men title for the 32X that appears to have been called Mind Games, featuring Bishop, Wolverine, Rogue and Iceman. This title, developed by Xyrinx, maybe, may have been turned into the 32-bit console and DOS game The Incredible Hulk, The Pantheon Saga, which we may cover at a later date. But most intriguingly, X-Men 2 looked to have a more traditional follow-up, but one that would require a name change. X-Women, the Sinister Virus. This would have been a title focused on the ladies of the X-Men franchise. The most obvious heroes in the X-Men at the time would have been the Southern Belle, power-stealing rogue, the weather goddess Storm, and the telekinetic Jean Grey, who goes by Phoenix or Marvel Girl, depending on how genocidal she's feeling that day. The cancellation of this title and the potential for what it could have been may be covered if you let your voices be heard. But with this one never to happen, it would take Marvel two more decades to introduce an all-women team in the X-Men comics. So Sega would have been the one to break the glass ceiling on such a concept, all the way back in the radical 90s. Thanks again to Hero Wars for sponsoring this video, download it and start playing right now. Anyway, if you enjoyed this one, don't forget to subscribe, and I urge you to watch my video on why X-Men vs Street Fighter caused outrage. Yeah, cheerio.